space program experience a national tragedy with the explosion of the Space Shuttle Challenger from here at the Kennedy Space Center. The Challenger disaster remains one of the most haunting tragedies in space exploration history. A seemingly routine launch turned into an unprecedented catastrophe, leaving countless questions unanswered. The sheer scale of the disaster has led to numerous theories and revelations over the years. I came outside and I said, there it goes, and I watched it go up, and then suddenly, boom! How did systemic failures and overlooked warnings contribute to this tragic event? What are the most unsettling details that have emerged since that fateful day? Brace yourself as we uncover the new Challenger disaster details that will chill you to the bone. The birth of NASA's Space Shuttle Program. In the 1960s, as NASA raced to land on the moon, hey, you're beautiful. 257 feet coming down at five. They also dreamed of a space plane that could be used over and over again. Politicians were getting nervous about the high costs of rockets that could only fly once. They were excited about the idea of a space plane that could launch like a rocket and then land back on Earth like a regular airplane. This seemed like a smart way to save money compared to the single-use rockets. Though ideas for such a space plane had been around since the 1950s, they were mostly just sketches and basic calculations. But in early 1972, a big step was taken. NASA officially kicked off work on what would become the Space Shuttle. The plan was to build a fleet of four shuttles, each named after famous ships. When Columbia, the first shuttle designed for space missions, was introduced, it was touted as a game-changer. Columbia now rolling on to the proper azimuth for a 39-degree inclination to orbit. The plan was for it to cut launch costs dramatically and to carry out missions every week. However, some experts doubted these ambitious claims. The first mission would be led by veteran astronaut John Young, with rookie astronaut Bob Crippen as his pilot. The Space Shuttle Columbia, with astronauts John Young and Robert Crippen aboard, lifted off on time from Cape Canaveral. This was a historic first testing a new launch system with a crew on board. Young was key in convincing NASA that Columbia's initial flight should skip a risky maneuver that involved the shuttle flipping and returning to the launch site. It came off the tank in Columbia's launch and hit the wing. Several pieces of it hit the wing. In April 1981, Columbia made its first trip into space. It had been nearly six years since an American had flown in space. The purpose of Columbia's first flight, along with the next three missions, was to test the shuttle in space. Five, four, we've gone for main engine start. We have main engine start. The crew found issues like loose thermal tiles on the engine pod. These tiles were essential for protecting the shuttle during re-entry, and problems with them would be a recurring issue. Columbia landed safely, but not without problems. The shuttle had significant tile damage and a buckled undercarriage door. Engineers introduced a new method for attaching the tiles, and were confident they could address other issues. It took NASA 103 days to get the shuttle ready for its next flight. Two, one, zero, all engine running. Which featured a white painted external fuel tank saving 272 kilograms. For this mission, Joe Engel was the commander, with Dick Truly as his pilot. All four shuttle test flights had two-man crews. In the following three years, the space shuttles Challenger, Discovery and Atlantis began their missions, focusing mainly on launching commercial satellites into orbit. Despite ambitious goals of launching a shuttle every week, the actual pace was much slower. Each shuttle could carry up to three standard-sized communication satellites. As the fleet started deploying these satellites, some costly missions faced problems when faulty boosters left satellites stranded in low Earth orbit. This led to new rescue missions and introduced a groundbreaking capability to retrieve satellites. Although the shuttles took longer to refurbish between flights, NASA aimed to increase the frequency of missions. The Challenger Crew In 1986, the Space Shuttle Challenger was set for its 10th mission, and its crew was a top-notch team of astronauts with a wealth of experience. Each member had special skills and knowledge, crucial to the mission's goals, which included launching the TDRSB satellite and carrying out important scientific experiments. G. Resnick, Ron McNair, and uh, pilot Mike Smith. Leading this highly skilled crew was Commander Francis Dick Scobie. Known for his precise and strong leadership, 
Scobie was a seasoned veteran whose career was marked by dedication and bravery. His life and career became closely linked with the tragic mission that day. Weather like this on uh, Sunday when we launch, and y'all do the best to keep it that way if you would. Born on May 19, 1939, in Clay Ellum, Washington, Commander Scobie had a remarkable journey. He started with a passion for aviation in his hometown of Auburn and built an impressive career as an Air Force pilot, amassing over 7,000 flight hours. He also earned a degree in aerospace engineering from the University of Arizona. Scobie's early fascination with flying led him to the Air Force, where he gained extensive experience as a fighter and test pilot. The pilot of the Challenger was Michael J. Smith, born on April 30, 1945, in Beaufort, North Carolina. Second in command, pilot Michael Smith, age 40, a decorated Navy pilot from North Carolina. Smith graduated from the United States Naval Academy and served in Vietnam, where he flew numerous combat missions. He earned a degree in naval science and a master's in aeronautical engineering, and he completed advanced jet training, earning his aviator wings in 1969. Smith flew various aircraft, including A-6 intruders during the Vietnam War, and participated in the intense Operation Linebacker. Chosen as an astronaut in 1986, Smith joined the elite ranks of NASA's new astronauts. His skills and ability to handle pressure were key factors in his selection. On the Challenger, he was the pilot and second-in-command, supporting Commander Scobie. Mission specialist Judith Resnick was a remarkable figure in space exploration. Known for her incredible knowledge and skills, as a key member of the Challenger mission, Resnick brought a wealth of expertise to the team. It rubbed off on me, and I think the guys behind me are hoping that it hasn't also. Born on April 5th, 1949, in Akron, Ohio, she was one of NASA's first female astronauts. One of the first women to experience weightlessness. Selected in 1978. With a PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Maryland, Resnick had already made significant contributions to science and engineering. She had flown on one previous shuttle mission, STS-41D, where she expertly managed scientific experiments and the spacecraft's robotic arm. During that mission, she helped deploy three satellites and conducted important biomedical research. Her second and final spaceflight was on the Challenger, where her pioneering spirit and dedication to exploration left a lasting impact. Mission specialist Ellison S. Onizuka, born on June 24, 1946, in Kealakekua, Hawaii, was another extraordinary member of the Challenger crew. It's really a pleasure to be back. I'm looking forward to going to fly this one. As a groundbreaking astronaut, he blended scientific brilliance with his rich cultural heritage. Onizuka, who was part of NASA's first Asian American astronaut class in 1978, earned his PhD in aerospace engineering from the University of Colorado. His fascination with space began in childhood, and he pursued it relentlessly, joining the Air Force as an aerospace flight test engineer before becoming an astronaut. His role on the Challenger showcased his dedication to advancing human knowledge and left an inspiring legacy. Which will affect both our society and the rest of the world. Mission specialist Ronald E. McNair, born in 1950, was a trailblazer who overcame significant challenges to achieve greatness. And I intend to be a part of the crew to make the first return landing to the Cape in about a week. Growing up in a disadvantaged African-American community, McNair faced many obstacles, but never let them deter him from his scientific dreams. After earning a BS in physics from North Carolina A and T State University, and a PhD in laser physics from MIT by age 26, McNair gained recognition as a leading expert in laser physics at Hughes Research Laboratory. His impressive achievements caught NASA's attention, and he was selected for the Space Shuttle program in 1978. Sharon Krista McAuliffe was a remarkable woman who became a key figure in NASA's Teacher in Space program. I don't think any teacher has ever been more ready to have two lessons in my life. A groundbreaking initiative aimed at encouraging students to explore careers in science and technology. A high school social studies teacher from Concord, New Hampshire, McAuliffe, was selected from over 11,000 applicants to make history as the first civilian to fly aboard the space shuttle. Announced by President Ronald Reagan in August 1984, to choose as the first citizen passenger in the history of our space program one of America's finest, a teacher.
This program was part of NASA's broader effort to involve the public in space exploration. McAuliffe was chosen after a comprehensive selection process, which included medical exams, interviews, and detailed briefings, with Barbara Morgan from Idaho chosen as her backup. For the next year, McAuliffe trained diligently at the Johnson Space Center, preparing to deliver two live lessons from space on subjects like magnetism, Newton's laws, and basic machines. Her selection as the first teacher in space marked a historic milestone, aiming to bring the excitement of space exploration into classrooms and inspire future generations of scientists and engineers. With her background in teaching, McAuliffe was ideally suited to engage students and share her extraordinary experience in a way that would truly captivate and inspire them. Greg Jarvis, born August 24, 1944, in Detroit, Michigan. I'm uh, very proud to be part of the program that NASA and Hughes have put together, and I'm glad to be representing the Hughes aircraft. Was a remarkable American engineer and astronaut. After finishing high school at Mohawk Central in 1962, Jarvis pursued higher education at the State University of New York at Buffalo, where he earned his Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering in 1967. He continued his studies at Northeastern University, achieving a master's degree in 1969. Following his academic accomplishments, Jarvis joined the United States Air Force in 1969, serving with distinction until 1973 when he retired as a captain. He then began a new chapter at Hughes Aircraft as a payload specialist in 1984. Jarvis was selected to be a payload specialist for the Challenger Shuttle's STS-51L mission, NASA's 25th shuttle flight. His role was to test how weightlessness affected fluids. Sadly, the mission ended in tragedy before it could even reach space. Flight controllers here looking very carefully. The shuttle exploded during launch, and Jarvis, along with Dr. Ronald McNair and Krista McAuliffe, was found on the shuttle's lower mid-deck. In honor of his legacy, the East Engineering Building at the University of Buffalo was renamed Jarvis Hall, and a memorial sculpture was installed on campus. Additionally, the New York Power Authority named a hydroelectric power plant near his hometown, the Gregory B. Jarvis Power Project, ensuring that his name and contributions will be remembered. The Challenger Disaster The preparation for the ill-fated Challenger launch was a monumental task that spanned several months, involving 37 weeks of intense crew training. The accident happened after the original launch date had already passed. On January 15th, NASA conducted a crucial flight readiness review. They had to reschedule the launch several times, weighing factors like potential landing failures and the best time to observe Halley's Comet, a key part of the mission, as well as the launch of the Spartan satellite. After numerous adjustments, NASA finally set the launch for January 22, 1986. However, the mission faced further delays in the days leading up to the launch. That January was exceptionally cold, with temperatures dropping well below freezing. Challenger was set to launch in weather conditions that no shuttle had ever faced before. Gene Thomas, Challenger launch director, remarked, Even though we knew there was a risk of catastrophic failure, NASA was determined to increase the number of launches. Due to these severe weather concerns, the launch was moved from the 26th to the 27th. On the 27th, Challenger came dangerously close to launching. On the morning of January 27th, everything seemed on track. The crew began preparations at 12.30 a.m., secured their seats by 70.56 a.m., and were ready by 5.07 a.m. However, an hour later, they reported a door ajar signal, which turned out to be an issue with an outer hatch. The ground crew struggled for two hours to fix the problem, battling with frozen screws using screwdrivers, a drill, and a hacksaw. By the time they managed to remove the hatch handle, the crew had been waiting for five hours and the launch window had closed. Bob Siek, the Kennedy shuttle chief, humorously commented, it felt more like watching a rerun of the Three Stooges than preparing for a space shuttle launch. He added, it just wasn't our day. We'll recycle and aim for Tuesday morning. The Space Shuttle Challenger finally lifted off on January 28, 1986, at 11.30 a.m. from Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 39B. The crew went through their standard prep routine, 
which included arriving at the launch pad, strapping in, and putting on their spacesuits. They performed a series of checks and tests to ensure the shuttle was ready. Ice inspections were carried out to confirm the safety of the launch pad. These inspections were vital, as any issues found would have caused further delays. When the time came, the engines and solid rocket boosters ignited, and the shuttle ascended into space with the crew on board. The moments after liftoff were brief, but devastating. And liftoff, liftoff of the... Just 6.6 .6 seconds into the flight, the space shuttle's engines roared to life, quickly followed by the ignition of the solid rocket boosters seven seconds later. The Challenger began its roll maneuver, with mission control in Houston confirming the move. The shuttle's main engines throttled down to 94% at 24 seconds, then to 65% at 42 seconds, before surging back up to 104% at 59 seconds. At 65 seconds, the crew's last communication came through, confirming that everything was running smoothly and the systems were functioning well. But in a heartbeat, catastrophe struck. At 73 seconds, the signal from the shuttle was lost, leaving mission control in shock and silence. The crew had no warning of the disaster that was about to unfold. Live video footage provided the first clues of the tragedy, showing radar tracking multiple objects soon after. The flight dynamics officer in Houston confirmed the horrifying news. The shuttle had exploded. 30 seconds later, the range safety officer sent a destruct signal to the solid rocket boosters. A plume of smoke was visible from the boosters, which was an alarming sign. The shuttle's path started to veer off course, causing the crew to experience an intense increase in G-force. Commander Scobie and Pilot Smith discussed the strange trajectory and the smoke captured by the spacecraft's recorder. Tragically, the failure of an O-ring seal around 73 seconds after liftoff led to a massive explosion. Instead, it broke up at 73 seconds. Destroying the external tank and the solid rocket boosters. The crew had no warning of the impending disaster and the shuttle broke apart in just seconds. The New York Times reported that Mission Control continued to reassure the public that everything was fine in the moments following the disaster. Public Affairs Officer Stephen A. Nesbitt was still tracking Challenger on radar 105 seconds after launch, unaware that the shuttle had already disintegrated. The crew's emergency packs were activated, and the last recorded voice was pilot Michael J. Smith saying, uh-oh at the 73rd second mark. Despite the main engines still firing, the crew couldn't control the shuttle's trajectory. The shuttle shattered at about 15 kilometers altitude, resulting in an instantaneous and tragic end for the crew. There were no options for survival or escape. The crew and mission controllers were powerless to stop the tragedy. Honoring the Challenger crew, the day after the Challenger disaster, President Reagan gave a moving speech honoring the crew. Who have preserved our liberty and our freedom by making the supreme sacrifice. He quoted the poet and pilot, John Gillespie Meiji, saying, We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them this morning, as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. To figure out what went wrong, Reagan created a special commission led by former Secretary of State William P. Rogers. This team, called the Rogers Commission, investigated the technical problems and the broader issues that led to the decision to launch Challenger that day. They wrote a report with recommendations for NASA to fix these problems. With the necessary changes made, shuttle flights started again in September 1988 after a 32-month pause. The first seven missions used Launch Pad 39B, while Pad 39A was being updated. Out of respect, officials chose not to provide details about the condition of the crew's bodies when they were recovered. To share the grief that we all feel, and perhaps in that sharing, to find the strength. Reports indicated that their cabin was mostly intact, with some personal items floating to the surface and research materials still inside. NASA, as quoted by the Los Angeles Times, stated, 
Local security measures are being taken to ensure that the recovery operations are conducted safely and orderly. And emphasized, we prefer not to release further details out of respect for the families. The New York Times reported that the crew's remains were so badly damaged that they could not be recognized as human. The identification of the bodies was carried out at Patrick Air Force Base Hospital, about 24 miles from Cape Canaveral, by the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. The cremated remains of the Challenger crew are interred at Arlington National Cemetery in Virginia. All seven of their remains were mixed together and placed in a memorial at Section 46, Grave 1129, while two crew members, Francis R. Dick Scobie and Michael J. Smith, have individual graves in the cemetery. The memorial is adorned with the touching poem, High Flight, by Royal Canadian Air Force pilot, John Gillespie Magee Jr., which includes the lines, Sunward I've climbed, and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds, and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of. Over the years, numerous tributes have been paid to the Challenger crew. In Montpellier, Vermont, a small black granite monument was erected by private citizen Danny Roselli, son of a local granite company president, shortly after the disaster. This isolated memorial stands off the road. The Challenger Center for Space Science and Education was founded in 1986 by the astronauts' families. The center and its network of Challenger Learning Centers began in Houston in 1988. They use space-themed activities to teach students about science, technology, engineering, and math. So far, more than 5.5 million students around the world have benefited from these programs. The Challenger Center experience is dynamic and unparalleled to anything else offered to students. Onizuka's daughter, Janelle, was a talented soccer player at Clear Lake High School, close to Johnson Space Center. Before he left for space, she gave him a special soccer ball, signed by her teammates, as a heartfelt gift. In 2016, NASA astronaut R. Shane Kimbrough, who had been inspired by Onizuka's story, took the ball with him on his mission to the International Space Station. The ball floated in space for 173 days, a symbol of a dream fulfilled. When Kimbrough returned to Earth, he honored Onizuka's memory by presenting the soccer ball to the Onizuka family during a football game halftime ceremony. The family then donated it back to Clear Lake High School, where it continues to inspire students and sits on display. A recovered artifact sitting in a locked vault somewhere. Tragically, after the space shuttle accident, the ball was found among Onizuka's items. It was returned to his family, who chose to donate it to the high school, where it was proudly displayed for 30 years. After the tragic Challenger disaster, NASA decided to end the Teacher in Space program in 1990. In 2015, the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex unveiled Forever Remembered, a special exhibit created by NASA in partnership with the families of the astronauts who tragically lost their lives in the Challenger and Columbia disasters. This touching memorial is a heartfelt tribute to the brave crews and their spacecraft, focusing on the importance of learning from these tragic events. The exhibit features personal items from each crew member and fragments recovered from both the Challenger and Columbia. At the same location, the Space Mirror Memorial displays the names of the seven astronauts who perished in the Challenger accident, carved into its reflective surface. Every January, NASA commemorates the fallen astronauts from Challenger, Apollo 1, and Columbia with a day of remembrance. This day is dedicated to honoring their memory, reflecting on the incidents that led to these tragedies, and recognizing the profound changes made in NASA's operations and safety practices. Ignored warnings. Fresh insights from interviews and testimonies about the Challenger disaster reveal information that clarifies what we thought we already knew. Alan McDonald, who represented the Utah-based company concerned with rocket and missile propulsion systems, Morton Theocol, was on site overseeing the solid fuel rocket boosters. I was the director of the Space Shuttle Solid Rocket Motor Project for Morton Theocol. He vividly recalls leaving the launch control center and feeling the intense wind whipping sand into his contact lenses, making it hard to walk to his car. After a short visit to a friend's house, 
Allen received a call from Bob Ebling, a colleague. Bob told him that a meteorologist in Orlando had warned that the strong winds that led to one of the launch's cancellations could bring a cold front by the next morning, possibly dropping temperatures to 18 degrees Fahrenheit. Allen was deeply concerned about how the cold might affect the O-ring seals on the boosters. Back in Utah, the engineers were also worried and asked Allen to get more detailed weather reports from NASA. He agreed but insisted that, once the information was collected, it should be presented to the engineers. He wanted a comprehensive presentation detailing what was known and unknown about the situation, along with the engineer's recommendation for the lowest safe launch temperature. Allen organized a teleconference with engineers from Utah, the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, and NASA management at Cape Canaveral. Over a dozen engineers sent in their charts and unanimously recommended that the shuttle not be launched if the temperature fell below 53 degrees Fahrenheit due to concerns about the O-rings. At the end of the presentation, Bob Lund, the vice president of engineering, firmly stated that based on the engineers' findings, launching below 53 degrees Fahrenheit was not advisable. Allen was confident that this recommendation would lead to a launch postponement. I was shocked because I felt that that was a slam dunk. They would accept that and just postpone the launch. However, to his dismay, top executives questioned the recommendation and, in a surprising move, overruled it. They gave NASA the go-ahead to launch Challenger at a much colder temperature of 38 degrees Fahrenheit. Some engineers protested, but their concerns were overshadowed by fears of losing valuable government contracts if the launch was delayed further. NASA demanded a written confirmation of the recommendation, but Allen refused. He decided to take a stand, saying, I would not sign that recommendation. I feel we're taking risks that we should not take. It'll have to come from the plant if it comes from anybody, but not me. The O-rings were not the only problem. Allen, during the teleconference, shared that strong winds were blasting up to 70 knots and ice was everywhere. NASA officials were pressing Morton Theocol for more information. They responded, Al, you've raised concerns that might not be directly your responsibility, but we'll note them and consider them as advice. But where are the facts from your superiors? The next day, the ICE team sprang into action. They were busy knocking icicles off the shuttle and using an infrared pyrometer gun to measure temperatures, which were recorded in NASA logbooks. Later, a review of these logs revealed that the temperature near the troubled solid rocket booster was below 28 degrees Fahrenheit, much colder than the 31 degrees Fahrenheit ambient air temperature, which was just above freezing. The area was shaded from the sun and exposed to harsh westerly winds. Now it's time for today's subscriber pick. Buried in a forgotten NASA archive, a newly discovered file sheds light on dark secrets that could have changed everything about the Challenger disaster. The document, marked with red warning stripes, reveals disturbing details about the events leading up to the ill-fated launch. New Challenger disaster details that will chill you to the bone have surfaced, painting a terrifying picture of hidden motives and unexplained occurrences. According to the file, a secretive group within NASA conducted an unauthorized experiment in the weeks before the launch. This test, meant to simulate the extreme conditions the shuttle would face, produced alarming results that were never reported to the mission's main team. The document describes how these findings were deliberately concealed with several key figures involved in a covert operation to keep the information from reaching higher-ups and the public. The file details a tense meeting between top executives who, driven by mounting pressure and the looming launch window, made the fateful decision to proceed despite their reservations. One chilling passage reveals that a whistleblower tried to warn the team, only to be silenced and dismissed. The final hours before the launch were fraught with secretive maneuvers and hidden agendas, culminating in the tragic explosion that shocked the world. As the chilling new revelations unfold, they force us to confront the disturbing possibility that the Challenger disaster was not just a tragic accident, but a catastrophic result of concealed truths and unchecked decisions, shaken by new revelations. The families of those who tragically lost their lives in the Challenger disaster have been struck with a powerful wave of emotion following new revelations about the event. For decades, 
They've endured deep grief, their memories anchored by the official account of the accident. But now, they're being forced to confront a more complex and unsettling truth. The events of January 28, 1986, have reopened painful wounds, as new evidence suggests that critical warnings from engineers and other key figures were ignored. For example, June Scobie Rogers, the wife of Commander Francis R. Scobie, expressed her distress in a recent interview, saying, It feels like we've been deceived. Learning that a warning might have prevented this catastrophe makes it all the more unbearable. Similarly, the family of Krista McAuliffe, the first civilian teacher chosen for space, has been devastated by the knowledge that crucial safety measures were overlooked. The realization that those in charge failed to take the necessary precautions to ensure her safety has been incredibly painful. The general public, too, has reacted with shock and outrage to these new revelations. The release of this information has sparked widespread controversy and reignited discussions about the Challenger disaster. Unfortunately, many media outlets have hesitated to fully report on these newly disclosed facts and witness testimonies, revealing just how impactful these findings are on our understanding of the tragedy. Amidst these revelations, historian and aircraft accident expert Dr. Robert Bellinger, working within NASA, uncovered systematic errors that had previously gone unnoticed. Bellinger concluded that these findings expose a breakdown in communication and decision-making processes within the agency. Aerospace scientist Dr. Karen Morse added that the newly uncovered technical details about the O-ring failure highlight how a small design flaw can lead to a massive disaster. The insights from these experts reveal significant gaps in safety measures and how this new information contradicts earlier accounts of the disaster. While the mechanical aspects of the story once centered on the O-ring failure and the rapid explosion, the newly uncovered documents and interviews shed light on a broader range of factors that contributed to the tragedy. These include internal communication issues within NASA, a lack of consideration for safety measures, and the pressure to meet deadlines. As a result, the historical memory of the Challenger catastrophe is shifting from a purely technical focus to one that also encompasses organizational and administrative failures. A turning point for NASA's safety. The Challenger disaster, which struck on January 28, 1986, left a lasting mark on both NASA and the public's view of space exploration. This tragic event was a huge setback for NASA and its space program, shaking the nation's confidence and prompting a major overhaul in safety practices. Following the disaster, NASA took bold steps to prevent future tragedies. They introduced stricter safety measures and revamped their risk management strategies. New safety protocols were put in place, including stronger and more dependable systems, and more thorough testing was conducted to ensure everything was reliable. Astronauts and engineers received enhanced training to prepare them for emergencies. This included realistic simulations and detailed training materials to better equip them for any situation. NASA also improved communication and coordination within the agency and with its contractors, establishing clearer protocols and sharing more detailed information. The space agency became more transparent, providing the public and media with comprehensive updates and establishing stronger oversight to maintain accountability. While the Challenger disaster was a devastating blow, it also sparked important changes and heightened awareness about safety in space travel. The Brave Crew's legacy continues to inspire and remind us of the vital importance of rigorous safety measures. What do you think could have been done to avert the Challenger disaster? Let us know your opinion in the comments below.